Assalamualaikum viewers of Imam Hussain TV. Often, programs transmitted from Imam Hussain TV naturally spell out the discourses of the spread of Islam, du'as, ziyarat, teachings of the holy Ahlul Bayt alayhim salam, Islam in a capitalist, social, pluralist form. However, all of these actions can more or less be discussed and also performed at almost any time, at any place. However, there is one action which is also compulsory, i.e. wajib, that has to be performed at a specific time, a specific place, and in a specific land. It is, of course, Hajj. Tonight's program will be looking at the social ideals, the political ideology of <coughs> Hajj, and also the legalities of it. With me tonight, we have Dr. Sayyid Amar Nakshwani. Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as salam wa rahmatullah. Thank you for joining us again. My pleasure, thank you. Um, again, it's uh, a great honor to be here, and uh, it's a topic that uh, I think a number of viewers have been looking forward to uh, listen to and watch. Um, a unique program because it's obviously talking and hopefully going to be looking at Hajj, which is only going to be performed at a certain time. We've got a lot of material here to cover tonight, inshallah. Mm -hmm. So um, the first one I'd like to cover, the first point, essentially, and is, is with regards to the political aspects. Let's view how the family, Quraysh, inherited from the great Nabi Ibrahim Islam, and, and then became the custodians of the Holy Kaaba. What exactly happened? Yes, the, the Arabs had immense respect uh, for the period of Hajj. Uh, it was actually a period of great festivity, and one may argue that until today there isn't much difference. It's quite a festive period. Yeah. If you look at many of us when we had gone to Hajj, there'll be the times where we're performing you know, our amal, for example, um, going to the mosque, reciting your prayers, but also you wouldn't mind as well going to, you know, for a bit of shopping, or you don't mind going to the odd uh, American uh, burger joint right, that may be right. in, yeah, um, yes. in Mecca or in Medina. And I think at that time, uh, you'll find that the merrymaking and the festivities uh -huh. uh, took place over a 40-day period. Right. The Quraysh's honor uh, before the birth of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, one. or one may argue before the announcement of his prophethood, is... Seen in the fact that they are the ones where everybody from the followers of Abraham flocks to in order to honor that wonderful site behind us. Right. Indeed, you find that over that 40 day period, the people would come from far and wide. Uh -huh. And some of the actions that we perform today are actions that they used to perform as well. So, for example, the tawaf around the Kaaba is the tawaf that they used to perform as well. In the days of Jahiliya, okay. the pre-Islamic Arabian community used to also... Why is that so? Well, it, once again, it's an honor, firstly, that this is God's house. Okay. There are many images of God in that house. But this is God's house. And this is in honor of Prophet Abraham who built... God's house, and we are the descendants of Abraham. The custodians of the Kaaba, as we know, was Abdul Muttalib, the great mm -hmm. renowned personality of the religion of Islam, the grandfather of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his family. And Abdul Muttalib is the one who looks after the Kaaba, and another of the famous personalities who has a role in the period of Hajj and is respected highly is Khuwailid, the father of Khadija. Oh, okay. Yes. Gotcha. Khuwailid really means Khalid. Right. So if you hear the name Jawaber, it means Jabber. And if you hear the name Khuwailid, it means Khalid. I see. And what you have there is you have a renowned personality. They would look after these people when they would come towards the period of Hajj. They'd look after their camels. They'd give them water. But... Sadly, what began to happen upon the onset of the religion of Islam was that they had forgotten the morals and the spiritual aspects 
of Hajj. Any act of worship can either be an act of oscillating tongue movements, uh -huh. can either be an act of you know, moving your feet or moving your knees, or it can be an act where your heart is very much involved in the act. For example, when it comes to prayer, there are those who pray, yeah. but their prayers <laughs> thrown back at them on the Day of Judgment. But keep this prayer. What was that prayer? Right. Your heart was not in this prayer. Okay. okay. The Prophet would always tell the people, first, sallu kama yusalli. pray like you saw me pray. And then secondly, pray as if it's your last prayer. Uh -huh. Meaning that the heart should be involved. Talk to Allah, open up. Likewise with the Hajj, it could be a case where the Arabs are going around the Kaaba, but okay. gossiping. Yes, of the course. The person could be going around the Kaaba, checking his phone. No tasbih, just checking on the WhatsApp messages and tawaf. Let me check what's going on here. Okay, that's, let me delete this message. Okay, let me move on to that message. Now, it's not haram for a person, for example, to be checking their WhatsApp messages. But when you're around that very structure, that is seen as the axis where all energy is guided yes, towards. Yes, yes then you'd want to feel a bit of that. You'd want to be in a state of introspection mm -hmm. or a state of reflection. So what, the, what was happening sadly was they begun to forget the favors Allah bestowed upon them by having that Kaaba in their midst, number one. Okay. By having Ibrahim salam and Ismail and Hajar, number two, all being involved in the building of that Kaaba. Number three, by even seeing how Allah protects that house when the companions of the elephant yes. who came to attack the house of God Surah Fihil Surah Fihil Hassan they came to attack the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala showed the Quraysh Alam tara kayfa fa'ala rabbuka bi ashab al-fihil Alam yaj'al kaydahum fi tadlil wa arsala alayhim tayran ababil until then, even after the surah, after that, what came? لِإِلَافِ قُرَيْشِ إِلَافِهِمْ رَحْلَةَ الشِّتَّاءِ وَالصَّيْفِ فَلْيَعْبُدُوا رَبَّ هَذَا الْبَيْتِ الَّذِي أَطْعَمَهُمْ مِنْ جُوعٍ وَآمَنَهُمْ مِنْ خَوْفٍ This Lord is the one who honored you Arabs. You weren't even worth honoring. Really. As in what was a barbaric group of people at that time, maybe even till now, but a barbaric group of people. And even Fatima al-Zahra alludes to this in her famous khutbah. Okay. The famous khutbah known as al-Fadakiyah, the khutbah al-Fadakiyah. Yeah. She makes it clear to them that you guys were, were on, the, on the edge of, or on the, you know, on the, in the pits of hell. Yeah. It's my father who came and saved you. Really. Because these people were now doing tawaf naked. Today, when we circumambulate around the Kaaba, We'll wear the most humble piece of clothing, for example. We'll wear a piece of clothing that's a piece of clothing that reminds us of the shroud, shroud. that we're going to rise with on the Day of absolutely, Judgment. Absolutely, absolutely. These people started going around the Kaaba naked. Now you've got gossiping going on, got nudity. Look at the message, the pristine message of Abraham, what happened to it. You've got idols being worshipped and being yes. bowed down to. Yeah. You've got people not just bowing to an idol. There were some people who would get, you know, saffron, zafaran. Right. Yes, yes, yes. Our Iranian viewers will know it because Iranians absolutely love yeah, zafaran. Yeah, they use it in their cooking and so on. So use it in the cooking, gives that lovely taste. Yeah. Some of the Arabs would go and put zafaran next to the idol. Some of them would go and put milk next to the idol. Ibrahim broke the idols of his time. And now the children of Abraham, or the descendants of Abraham in some cases, were now encouraging the building of those idols and the mounting of those idols in the Hajj period. So what you had was, in the lead up to the announcement of the religion of Islam, Hajj was still an institution. People respected the Kaaba, Safa and Marwa. Yeah. People would respect those areas of Arafah and Mina and Muzdalifah. Right, right. But the spiritual essence had gone. Oh, I see. And their yes. acts had become polluted. Okay. Yeah. Um, so in today's modern era, naturally, mm. the custodianship is in the hands of 
the uh, Saudi government. But really, realistically, and I'm sure the viewers would be interested to know this, who does it actually belong to? Well, you know, the, the king has the honorable title of being known as uh, Khadim al Haramain al Sharifain. You know, he's the, he's the custodian and the servant of the, of the two holy shrines, you know, Mecca and Medina. Reality is that we're still getting visas to go there. Yeah. So on the one hand, those who are saying that, you know what, it's in the hands of the worst and the most oppressive and so on. Yes, there are political differences for sure. Right. But if I come from a particular country where I can see that there are visas being given for me to go, then I could go there. I can perform the rituals of Hajj. No one's going to stop me. Not to say there haven't been skirmishes. Not to say there hasn't been obscenities. Not to say there hasn't been arrogance shown right. by the custodians of that era. Okay. Of that area. But I think it's important for us as well that we can either stress on this that these people who are in charge are the ones who follow the Wahhabi ideology. Of course, uh -huh. they don't like to be called Wahhabi. They believe there's no such thing. Okay, you follow the, the Salafi um, ideology. However, there are people from different countries who are followers of Ahlul Bayt who are welcome to come and perform the Hajj. So I think us going too far into always condemning um, you know, the Wahhabis and the Saudis and so on, I think that there are certain areas where we definitely needed to condemn. There are certain acts of oppression, no doubt, Jannat al yeah. and the way that that was destroyed, we'll continue to speak about that forever. But I think at the same time, um, there's no need for us to cause these skirmishes and troubles when we're going there on Hajj. And uh, you've, you've touched at some length in terms of what um, some of these um, people, as it were, maybe tribes, used to enact, you know, mm. going around the Kaaba, stuck through Allah, na whilst naked gossiping, placing idols, as it were, in the Holy Kaaba. But was also the, the Holy Kaaba hijacked? Well, the Kaaba, the Kaaba has been through a number of, has been through a number of attacks. That's for sure. Right. Uh, Yazid bin Muawiyah, famously. Okay. And Waqat al Harra. Uh, he is the one who attacked the Kaaba after Karbala. Uh -huh. Now we know, it's absurd to respect a person who orders his soldiers to attack the Kaaba. And we also know that in the period of Hajj, you're not even meant to kill a mosquito if it yes, comes. Yes, yes, right. Because when you're going to be going to Hajj very soon, Inshallah. you're going to find those moments where you've got this mosquito which okay. may be coming up your, you know, maybe coming up your shoulder, and you feel that it's about to bite you. Um, you know, and you're in that state of sanctity. Okay. So therefore, you wouldn't. We reached a stage where Yazid. Son of Muawiyah was ordering governors to kill Imam al Hussein, Islam, the grandson of the Prophet, by the Kaaba. Even if he's hanging by the Kaaba, you behead him. Then, to add insult to injury, Yazid actually orders his governors to attack the Kaaba, to attack the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the Kaaba, while in the days of Jahiliyyah, yeah. It was attacked by a form of idol worship, which was seen as a pollution and a sin in mm -hmm. Islam. Mm -hmm. I think those days of Jahiliyyah came back with uh, Abu Sufyan and his children. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And there's, um, if you can just confirm, or maybe um, there may be some narrations around this, the Holy Prophet, how many times did he perform Hajj? Or was it just once? And if it was just once, why, you know? Habibullah, Habibullah al-Mustafa, um, peace be upon him, and the Holy Ahlul Bayt and Islam. Why was it not performed more numerous times? Or was it performed in secret? Yeah, no, the Holy Prophet only performs Hajj once. Yeah. And the reason he performs yeah. Hajj once is because the political situation at that time, because you've got to remember, he's living where? He was living in Medina. Me Medina, yes. For him to be able to go and perform Hajj, he would have to be either, on the best of terms with the Quraysh at that time, 
or it would have had to have reached a stage where there was a peace treaty. Right. Or it would have to reach a stage where he'd have to overpower the Quraysh to be able to comfortably be in charge of Mecca or Medina. I see. Now we know that for the first six years of his period while he was in, um, while he was in uh, Medina, uh -huh. that first six year period is very clear that he was living in Medina and he could not go and do Hajj. So that means 18 years, one may argue, of his prophethood, uh -huh. he was not able to perform Hajj. First 13 years in Mecca, was not able to perform Hajj. Right. The ordinance of Hajj has not come down yet. Then the last 10 years in Medina, even if he wants to go back to Mecca, he's finding it difficult. Now that's when the, the famous Hudaybiyah peace treaty came in. Because with the Hudaybiyah peace treaty, what you had was the Holy Prophet trying to open some sort of inroad into Mecca. Okay. Where there is now possibly a chance that the Quraysh are going to allow him and his companions to come to Mecca, even if it's just for a few days. Right. So we don't want to come for the whole Hajj period. Okay. Okay. We just want to come for a few days. Will you allow us? And their reply was, okay, come for a few days. And that's it. Now they were able to do Umrah. Right. So the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family, does a couple of Umrahs. Okay. But then when he manages to overcome the Qurayshi elite after they've broken the Hudaybiyah peace treaty and he's able to win back Mecca, that's when he finally is able to perform the Hajj in peace. So therefore there was only one Hajj. You know, sometimes you hear people saying, the farewell pilgrimage. Yes, that's right. So that was the only one and only okay. pilgrimage. But it was the farewell pilgrimage because he dies a couple of months later. later. Yeah, so it's only one hajj. But subhanAllah, in that one hajj, he sets the basis of our understanding of the verses related to hajj. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now, in terms of the legalities of performing hajj, mm. um, where are the rulings derived from? Well, like we have in many cases when we're coming to any legislation, yeah. we're either going to, <clears throat> mainly we're going to be look at, looking at the Qur'an okay. or the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon his family, and looking at the way that they had performed Hajj. Right. The Qur'an will give us the basis that one of Allah's rights over us is Hajj. Therefore, in the roots of the religion of Islam, you know, the pillars we have, let's say when we talk about Usul al-Din, Usul al-Madhab, normally they add up to five. Yeah. But then we also talk about the Furu' al-Din. When we talk yeah. about the Furu' al-Din, you will see Salah is wajib. Yeah. Aqeem al-Salah. Yes. There's a clear command to perform Salah. To perform Salah. Atu al-Zakat. There's a clear give, command to give charity. وَأْمُرْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ وَنْهَا عَنِ الْمُنْكَرِ الْجِهَادِ الْخُمْسِ التَّوَلِّ تَبَرِّ yeah. Likewise, amongst the areas which has been made wajib for us is the act of Hajj. Hajj. وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حِجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنِ اسْتَطَاعَ إِلَيْهِ سَبِيلَ The first way we understood the laws of Hajj is from the Qur'an. That Allah has a right over all of us. And that is that we come and visit him. And what a wonderful, Absolutely. what a wonderful Absolutely. right it is. Absolutely. You know what? I, I get invited to many places. I'm honored that I get invited to many places. Yes. But to be invited to the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I think sometimes there's a lot of people out there when, they, when they're not going to hajj mm. or they make excuses for not going to hajj. Yeah, sure. The philosophy of realizing, number one, that when Allah says, I've got a right over you, meaning I've given you a lot in life, come visit me sometime. Exactly. Exactly. But number two, is there a better dinner invite than the banquet right. of the angels and the prophets of Allah? And do, do you think this is now going to uh, probably cause some discussion here, but um, do you think there should be some reformation in terms of the rulings? I mean, for example, if we're looking to answer to some without any names mentioned or anything like that, secular Muslims or people who may think that I just go about, I'm a good person, you know, I don't give harm to anyone, but should there be some sort of ease or slack or should there be some sort of reformation in regards to Hajj 
its rituals, its wajib actions? Is it too rigid? What, what, what would you have to say about that? Let's first understand where we got the laws from. Yeah. So when we've got the laws, we've got the Quran providing us with the laws of Hajj. That's clear. Then we have the Sunnah of the Prophet, peace be upon him, his family. Either I'm going to take all the laws from that one Hajj, or I'm going to also see the issues that came up in Hajj in the lives of the Ahl al-Bayt, Because we know the Ahl al-Bayt performed Hajj by foot, some cases, 20, 25 times. Yes. You know, the likes of Imam al-Hasan, these right. people were performing Hajj on a regular basis. So when we're looking for the laws, how do I do tawaf? Mm -hmm. Within which precincts do I do tawaf? How long do I, for example, stay in, uh, in, in Arafah? Yeah. And then when I go to Muzdalifah, what happens if I reach Mina before Fajr or after Fajr? And right. how long do I stay in? All of these laws we got from the teachings of the Ahl al-Bayt And that's why when the Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family says, I leave behind for you two weighty things, hold mm -hmm. on to them. You will never go astray. And this, ironically, this hadith of Thakalain is Thakalain. mentioned at Khum. Sahih Muslim narrates. He Which stopped stop. at Khum yeah. after Hajj. Hajj. Because some people always try and make this thing that, well, the Prophet's final sermon was at Hajj. No, it wasn't. In Sahih Muslim, the narration is there. The Holy Prophet, peace be upon him, his family stops at Khum. And he says that I leave behind for you two weighty things. Yeah. Hold on to them. You will not go astray. Not the Quran and Sunnah. There's no Sahih Muslim. There's no Quran and Sunnah. Quran and the Ahlul Bayt. What I see in the Quran. Does the Quran give me all the laws of Hajj? No, no. way. The Quran is made up of six and a half thousand verses. Yes. I defy anyone to show me at max, max 700 verses. In the Quran, which are legal. Max. Okay. Most people will show you 500 verses of the Quran, which are known as Ayat al-Ahkam, the legal verses. Mm -hmm. You will not find more than 700. Right. 700 being a max. Okay. Generally, people will say 500. Therefore, where do I get my understanding of the laws of Hajj from? I get my understanding of the laws of Hajj of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family. However, did all the cases come up in that one Hajj of the Holy Prophet, peace be upon his family? No. Did every single case come up that... There is now an increase in the size of the Muslim community and there are people flocking from far and wide. Where exactly is the miqat for these people? Where's the miqat for those people? Where do these people, for example, what do they do if they're at Muzdalifa for this time, at Mina for this time? Which supplications, even Mustahabbat, right. the Mustahabbat in the period of Hajj, I learned them from Ahl al-Bayt Now, we recognize that when the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family done Hajj, that number of people with him in Hajj mm -hmm. is considerably different to the three million odd who are at Hajj mm -hmm. in the next few weeks. Yeah. Yep. Let's say, okay, if we say at a maximum at that time, we say we're reaching six figures. Let's say yes. at Hajj. <clears throat> if that, now we're reaching three million. When we're reaching three million, are there certain reforms like you said yeah that need to take place and these reforms are they reforms that we conclude external to the texts of the quran and sunnah or I within see. okay what i mean by that is say for example there's a principle islamic law should not occasion any harm no islamic law should not occasion any harm harm there's something I used to see at Hajj regularly. Okay. When we're doing tawaf, we know that in Shi'i law, the main opinion was always that when you're doing the tawaf, you have to stay within the Kaaba Ka and Maqam Ibrahim. Ibrahim. Do you agree? That's right. Absolutely. In between. So what you used to always see, I... I would always say the strongest people I always saw Hajj was the Indonesian groups. All right. Don't let height deceive you. Okay. Even if the Indonesian is four foot three, he's stronger than the Nigerian seven foot seven. Okay. The Indonesians, when they're together, they're something else. Number two, then I'd see the group of the Shia, especially the ones where there's two men protecting 40 women. 
two men protecting 40, 40 women. And those two men suddenly become Superman. <laughs> and give me another of these uh, characters. Which one? Superman and Batman. They come around protecting these women. Women by themselves are stronger than any man. You put two men protecting them, you'll start hearing the screams. <laughs> when they start doing that, why? Because they want to ensure that their group of women do not leave that area between Maqam, Maqam Ibrahim and Kaaba. Kaaba. Now, when we're doing that, aren't we elbowing some people in doing that? Undoubtedly. I got elbowed by one person in Hajj. He elbowed me an elbow. I remember until today. <laughs> and ironically from the same madhab as me. <clears throat> and he elbowed me an elbow. And I'll never forget until today that the reason he did it was because I was being pushed. So when I pushed into him and his uh, merry woman who are all with him, mm -hmm. <coughs> he's got angry with me. Habibi, what do you want me to do? I've just had some... One, just push me. There's not four of us. There's many of us. Now, we're all causing harm to each other, aren't yeah, we? Yes, and especially yes. with this ruling, it's causing harm. So what does Ayatollah Sistani conclude? And what do other maraja, maraja. in some cases conclude? Right. That a person may go outside of Maqam Ibrahim, that period, that area between Maqam Ibrahim and, uh, and the Kaaba. You may go outside that if it's going to cause harm. Okay, right. I don't believe any school in Islam, I don't believe any school in Islam's gates of ijtihad closed. No. Oh. I know that there are certain people who will say the Hanafi gate or the Shafi'i or the Malik or the Hanbali gates closed. I don't believe. I believe that all those madhahib, there was always renowned personalities who made sure that the doors of ijtihad in each madhab remained open. Now, while I may differ in terms of ijtihad in the presence of a ma'soom, what you find in the school of Ahlul Bayt is the door of ijtihad in this area isn't me using something outside of my texts to reach a conclusion. I'm using yes. a principle, yep. a hadith, mm -hmm. which is saying that Islamic law should not occasion harm. Right. If I'm seeing that this Islamic law is occasioning harm, then the marja hasn't remained quiet on this issue. The marja looked at the issue, and this is one of a number of issues, by the way. I believe that there are other areas of the Hajj, even when it comes to, you know, how you're, where you're sacrificing and how that goes to the poor, but is is that area, particularly the area of the poor, should we be so restrictive? And there's other areas about covering your head from head. the sun, yeah. where the rulings have opened f were open for reform in the cases of, okay. of the Maraja. So those people who are saying, you know what, the way we're doing it, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, his family did not do it that way, in the sense that right. uh, you know, the Prophet Muhammad would have appreciated that things have changed. Yes, there are scholars who have also shown reform or reconsideration of their opinions on the basis of time yeah, and sure, place. Sure, yeah. okay, alhamdulillah. Um, you touched on the point of, you know, the Holy Prophet talking about the farewell Hajj, as mm. it were, and then Ghadir Hum afterwards. Um, Muslims often follow social inc inclinations when in a group, okay? And sometimes there is a political stance and sometimes follow just actions based on what they've been informed of. So, essentially, should, how should we educate fellow Muslims? I mean, should they be gearing up to take some sort of focus on a political stance? That, and I don't mean in terms of showing respect or unity, as it were, standing, all dressed in the ahram, the white cloth, the shroud, as it were. Should there be another form to, for Muslims to actually take on when they go on Hajj? It's, it's a... It's an interesting question. I believe that when we're going there, we have to try as much as possible to represent our madhab in the best of ways. Right. When you get to Jannat al Baqiyah, you're going to, inshallah, be standing by 
Well, you're not exactly going to be standing so close because now they've pushed us Inclusive, further and further yeah. away. But you're going to be not too far from Imam Al Hassan and Imam Zain Al Abidin and Imam Al Baqir and Imam Al Sadiq. Yes, but you're going to have four or five characters who are going to stand there. One speaks Urdu, fluent. Right. One speaks Arabic, fluent. One speaks Farsi, fluent. Okay. One speaks English, fluent. They will antagonize you from every angle. Okay. That you showing respect to these people. Firstly, I'll say to you, we don't know who's buried there. Grandsons of Muhammad. Secondly, they might turn around to you and say, why do you even care about them? They're dead now. Say salam and move on. Right. Now, you've got a couple of options. One option is, you know what, let me start debating here. Another option, you've found some, they were antagonized by this, it kicked off. Okay. You've got others, you know what? Go to the side. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for allowing you to visit yeah. the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him and his family. Pray for your dearly departed souls. Mm -hmm. No need for anyone to make a scene. Likewise, there are many who believe that while they are there in Hajj, they should be putting certain slogans up. Oh, I see. Slogans, for example, if there's a political situation in the world, Yes. Down with so and so, down with so and so, down right. with so and so. The basis of that is that they say, well, Hajj is nothing unless there's a political aspect. But you don't have to raise awareness by causing chaos. You can raise awareness by sitting with your respective group, like you mentioned. Yeah. As social human beings, sit with them. And while you're sitting with your respective group, you discuss your affairs. Believe you me. Hajj Muhammad, when you're there, you're going to be seeing Muslims worldwide. You're going to be seeing African Muslims, Asian Muslims, European Muslims, American Muslims, Australian Muslims, Middle Eastern Muslims. Sit with them, learn from them, talk to them, see what their issues are. Understand what difficulties they're facing, understand what help they need. Mm -hmm. A person having a political Vision does not always have to result in a punch-up no, no. or a fight or a war of words. The country which you're visiting has made it clear who they idolize. They're not hiding behind anything anymore. They make it clear that we idolize so-and-so. And if you, for example, believe that that's not right, there are many different platforms to show this. It doesn't have to be only there. I believe that we've lost a lot of blood because of insisting on Standing antagonizing each other. Right. And you could tell there are sensitivities already. Right. And I would just hope one day we can all go to Hajj without there being a situation of I'm right, you're wrong, you're burning in hell and I'm going to heaven. Buddy, go there and reflect on your life. Yeah. Let everybody else reflect on their lives. There are certain Shia who go to Hajj who've never ever in their life met anyone from the Salafi background. There are certain Sunnis who go to Hajj who've never met a Shia in their life. I guarantee you. Yes. yes. I guarantee you. Yeah. yeah. That there are certain members of Ahl Sunnah from West Africa or from the Far East. They've never ever met a Shia in their life. There are some people from Bangladesh have never met a Shia in their life. Now you want to go there, what do you want to do? You want to leave a good impression? Leave a good impression. Yes. Doesn't always have to be, I'm here, anyone who disagrees with me, I'm going to fight, I'm going to raise the slogans, I'm going to... Even, let me make clear, there are those who go to Hajj and want to make a show, Allahumma kun li waliyika al hajjad they want to recite the dua loudly. <laughs> And they was say, Ya Muhammad, Ya Ali, Ya Fatima, Ya Hassan. I said, Habibi, there's no need to no, antagonize. No. Yeah. Right. Now I know you're passionate about the Imam, and I know that you're God's gift on earth in terms of your knowledge and love of the Imam. And I know that you love Imam Amir al muminin so much that your lifestyle is befitting and a mirror of his lifestyle. But don't push it in people's faces. Yeah, yeah. Um, just going back to this point, for example, say most people, I'd like to think, 
have been invited by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Hajj. What would you recommend to uh, people, inshallah, traveling to Hajj? Um, and also, um, you know, just the viewers in terms of what spiritual conditioning or exercises should they be actually implementing upon arriving there? Just go and enjoy it. Go and enjoy it. Right. I, I've seen people who've gone to Hajj and these people who've gone to Hajj become too pedantic. Okay. I accidentally lo looked in the mirror. Will I burn in hell? I accidentally had a hair fall out. Will I be scolded by an angel? Well, just chill out, bro. Right. Chill out. You know, you're, you, when you go to someone's house, when yes. you're invited, there's two types of people we go to. The ones where there's too many formalities and you're... You're happy to be there, but you're not as comfortable. As you. And then you got that best friend. Yeah. The one who you love going to their house because you could just chill, chill. in their house. Yeah. And when I say chill, I mean try and build that friendship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, okay. Go enjoy. Just be sincere. Be real. Be real. Mm. You know, and there's too many people out there, you know what? I need to go on six hajj courses before I go to hajj. Buddy, what is this? Okay. Where are you going to a war zone? <laughs> yes, respect the... Laws that have been given. But I don't want people going there, stale acts of worshippers. But rather you want people going there who are constantly in reflection. There's a period of accounting themselves. Okay. okay. Where am I heading? Right. I see. My heart is a heart of purity or is my haram pure? Yeah. There are many who will tell you. I accidentally just uh, spilled coke on my ihram. Am I going to die in the day of judgment right. or something? You know, and, and you look at them and you're just like, buddy, just forget relax. about that cloth and its purity. Think about the purity of your heart. Yeah, of course. Are you someone who's envious of everyone? Are you someone who tries to put people down all the time? Yeah. Arrogant? Okay. Yeah. Alhamdulillah, I'll say that. Viewers, we'll be um, going for a short break. Please do, do join us again very shortly. Hey. and welcome back to tonight's live show on Imam Hussein TV. Um, I do strongly recommend viewers to actually call in. The telephone number is 0203-515-0199. Sayyidina, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum assalam. So if we just quickly resume back to before the break, we were talking about how one should really behave, being real, sincere, and you gave a couple of good examples of just being really true and honest to yourself. If we can just maybe just recap quickly on that. Yeah, I, I just believe that yeah. many people who go on Hajj are more concerned with fulfilling the legal aspects. And I believe that they come back thinking, mm, that didn't really change me much. Right. Or I didn't really feel it. I'm being very real about yeah, this sure. as someone who's led, yes. you know, maybe five, six Hajj groups in my life. Alhamdulillah. And Allah has blessed me, alhamdulillah, for this. There was a time where people would come and literally panic. There'd be a state of panic. And I don't know if that panic is because they are in awe of their Lord or the panic is, I've just spent this much money, I best do this properly. Tell me what the laws are. I need to get home and say that I did everything properly. Nervous. Yeah, and nervous. And sometimes, this is, sometimes people in my job are the ones who make you nervous. <laughs> Honestly. Because sometimes we may be the ones when we're giving the... When we're giving the lecture, for example, or we're doing the course, if you do this, this happens. If you do this, kafara, 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 expiation, this, right. do that. Now, these are all important laws. I can't, you know, I'm not denying that. But we want people who go there where they see that the qalb has truly undertaken taqallub. Mm -hmm. That the heart truly heart. has rotated. 
has been moved. Ultimately, I don't want someone who comes back as a legal expert of Hajj. That if you are at Mina at this time and you are at Muzdalifa at this time. No, no, no. When you were at Muzdalifa under that dark sky, at that moment, did you feel equal with everybody? That all of you are looking for a place where mm -hmm. there's pebbles on the ground. Did you yeah. feel equal? When you went to Mina at that moment, Shaitan, who may have been your friend for, for, for a period of time, have you now come to a conclusion that all these acts which he used to invite you towards or certain acts or attributes you still have, you're going to now get rid of? So what we're saying is in that famous conversation Imam Zain al-Abdin has with Shibli yeah. and later works on Hajj have sought to emphasize a more spiritual aspect. Let me give you an example. Sure. The Imam says around the Kaaba, there are 120 mercies of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 60 of them are for the people who are doing tawaf. tawaf. So those who are in tawaf, and what a wonderful feeling. You, O oh creation, are constantly moving, whereas I remain firm, the one, the only. True? Yes. We're constantly struggling, Absolutely. With, but there remains a constant in the middle, and that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The, the laws of Allah, principles of Allah remain. We may differ, deviate, yeah, sure. good, but Allah remains. What you find is, 60 out of the 120 are for those in Tawaf. Okay. Well, how much is left, my dear brother Muhammad? You're in the world of finance. 60 is left. Yeah, 60 is left. 40 are for those who are performing Salah. Salah. 100,000 times multiplied mm. when you pray in Masjid al-Haram. Yes, the sacred mosque. The prayers are multiplied. How much? 60 plus 40? 100. What's yeah. left? 20. 20. 20 is for those who just sit and look at the Kaaba. Subhanallah. We'll come back to this point uh, yeah. just in terms of gazing at the Holy Kaaba and mm. what the blessings are of that. So I think there's a phone uh, caller. Asalaamu Alaikum. Uh, alaikum as yes, brother. Uh, your question, please. Uh, I, wa I wanted to ask uh, what are the rules regarding paying behind a non Shia Jamaa leader? Uh, what's there to do differently? Uh, okay. Yeah, that's it. Okay, thank you. Yes, we, we will face this when we go to Hajj. Right. That the prayer leader, maybe someone, for example, of the Hanbali Madhab. Yeah, it's a good question. There's, there's nothing wrong in praying behind them. Um, and we have instructions from the Imams of Ahlul Bayt to join the prayers of our brethren. We can pray behind them. But you would pray in Forada, for example, Forada. you would say the words yourself, you follow the actions, but you say the words yourself. As you know, there are some differences, differences. that exist in yeah, terms absolutely. of, yes, yes. not the order of Salah, but rather the no. wordings that yeah. are there. But otherwise, there is no harm okay. in praying behind. Okay. And in some cases, for example, someone might say, I might pray behind them, I've already prayed the prayer, I might pray this one, Qadha, for example. Mm -hmm. I may have certain Qadha prayers which I can make up in this prayer. Right. Yeah. We'll talk about the, some of the places of visitation whilst on Hajj. But before we do, let's just go back to... Looking to at the Kaaba. Looking at the, gazing at the Kaaba and also the benefits of Kaaba following immediately on, perhaps. You see, when I'm looking at the Kaaba, I'm taking a snapshot with a camera whose pixels, no camera on this earth is able to capture imagery like that. And that is the soul of the human being. SubhanAllah. The soul of the human can capture that image and you take it with you everywhere as well at that moment we know that there's a part a piece of jannah in front of us okay. that black stone right we know very well that this is the center of the creation of allah the house of allah on the earth there is a direct link with the house and the heavens heavens yes right you've above. moved from the physical to the metaphysical yeah Okay. You're now in the world of the seen and the unseen. Yeah. So, so you know, just to interject, sorry, uh, we've got another caller now. We'll come back again to this point. Yep. Um, salaam alaikum. Salaam alaikum. Alaikum salaam. Alaikum salaam. Yes. Uh, yeah. So uh, my name is Zain. I'm calling from London. Um, 
The Sayyid mentioned that, uh, alhamdulillah, that he has been blessed to go to uh, Hajj five or six times. And inshallah, Allah blesses him more to go even inshallah. more times. But uh, there are many people who are unfortunate enough not to be able to go to Hajj uh, every year. And some aren't even to go in their lifetime. And you see, like, for example, in Nigeria, they've actually made a Kaaba to, like, emulate that Kaaba, uh, the original one. Is that permissible? Uh, is it not? Does the state have advice on Sure. You know, I wish things were that easy where we yeah. can, for example, make a nice Kaaba in, in like uh, Mayfair or something tomorrow and, you know, and then go shave our heads, get a couple of sheep, sacrifice them, mm -hmm. and uh, Bob's your uncle. But sadly, it's not that <coughs> easy, you know, and, uh, and I know that there are certain people out there who wish it could be that easy. And I pray for those people. Sure. You know, Hajj is, is, of course, obligatory on the ones who can afford to go to Hajj. Yeah. Who aren't going to spend money which is going to keep their family in trouble. Who haven't taken money from people who want their money back. Because sometimes someone might say, I want to go to Hajj, but I have a loan. If you have a loan that's based on an agreement with someone, there's no harm. They know that you're going to pay it over a period of time. But if you're using someone's money and that per per person is not giving you permission and wants their money back, then there's issues. Right. So Hajj becomes obligatory, as the Quran said, وَلِلَّهِ عَلَى النَّاسِ حَجُّ الْبَيْتِ مَنْ عَلَيْهِ سَبِيلًا the istita'a must be there. But make sure that if you are able to go to Hajj, then you must go to Hajj. There is no, I can afford Hajj, but I don't want to go because that means when I come back, I'm going to have to be religious. And I don't want to be religious because I want to chill for about 14.6 years mm -hmm. and then I want to go to Hajj. Because there are people who have this. Of course. There are people who... That's who, right. And, and you know, sometimes I do wonder to myself, how could you be so arrogant with yeah, your Lord? Yeah. You know, your Lord's telling you come home. Yeah. And you're making excuses. Mm -hmm. And then your hajj becomes the hajj of qada because you were able to afford and you didn't go to hajj. It becomes a hajj which is qada. And you don't want to go to hajj in that state. You want to go the moment you can afford. And I must admit that, yes, the prices these days aren't easy. Right. But then... You asked me about the benefits of Hajj. When the Imams tell you whatever issue you have, Hajj will clear it. Don't worry. And those who are in a state of poverty, do not worry. You'll be looked after. That is one incentive. But I wouldn't take that as the be all and end all. I'm going to be honoring Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's guidance to me and the message of the great prophets of God. What okay. else do I want? Okay. Alhamdulillah. So now we have got another call. Salaam yeah. alaikum. Assalamu alaikum. Hello, assalamu alaikum. Alaikum salam. Yes, sir. Your question, please. Uh, so, uh, brother, uh, I wanted to ask uh, Sayyidina, it's not relating to uh, Hajj. Okay. Uh, I don't know if there's any chance you can please uh, be kind enough to explain to me the philosophy of istikhara and how it works and how it's sort of connected through Ahl al please. Okay, sure. sure. Uh, istikhara is, of course, when a person invokes the Lord for guidance in some cases by the use of the Quran in some tasbih. cases by the use of a sabha or a tasbih this is something that was taught by the Ahl al-Bayt to their family members and therefore is an act which is no doubt recommended okay but there are a couple of pointers that some of our grand scholars will teach us all the time number one before you take istikhara make sure you enter consultation and seek advice on an issue. Right. You know, there's someone who may, for example, say that I want to buy this house. Mm -hmm. And they tell him, listen, go ask the agents. Is it worth going for this house at that money or no? Yeah. He's like, no, no, I just want to do istikhara. Yeah, but ask the agents. Maybe the agents will tell you that in that area at the moment, it's not beneficial for you to buy at that price because it's going to plummet. Okay. No, I want to do an istikhara. Normally, the seeking of advice before taking that istikhara is something which we are told. Further than that, there has to be also an understanding that don't mess about with the istikhara. Right. There are some people... Say Take someone, an istikhara on, a on a, another istikhara and so on and so forth. Yeah, there's, there's some people who say you come and propose for, for their daughter. And you've got one of those really difficult father-in-laws to be. Mm -hmm. 
first time istikhara comes out good, he's like, no, I'm taking another one. Yeah, but buddy, if you're going <laughs> to ask Allah to help guide you, even though some scholars say it's makruh to do istikhara for, you know, for marriage, but let's say if you're looking for Allah's guidance, he's told you this person's yeah, good. good. No, I want to take istikhara. Second istikhara, good. No. Third istikhara, good. No. How long do we have left before he got to an istikhara which came out bad? Then he's like, I told you it's bad. Yes, you told us it's bad after six good istikharas. Thirdly, just because an istikhara comes out good, don't expect that that automatically means everything's going to be rosy. Right. Number one, the guy who you could have taken istikhara with may have lost connection on the Wi-Fi that day with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning that is not as respected as you thought. And that also, number two, what you see as good may not be what Allah sees as good. You take an istikhara, I want to marry someone. Comes out good. You end up divorced with them. But you say istikhara came out good. Well, maybe you have to go through that for you to find right. your path. We'll come back to the subject of Hajj very shortly. But just one point I just wanted to mm. ask. Could you just briefly mention the difference between istikhara and istishara? That's exactly what I said at the beginning. Al-istishara qabl al-istikhara. Meaning, istishara is when you're seeking to consult. Right. You know, you've got a surah in the Quran called shura. Shura. Which is surah number? I do 42, well done. Poets. Excellent, Muhammad Mirza. Well done. <laughs> La, that's shu'ara. Okay, okay. Shura, surah 42, consultation. Consultation, okay. That's and that cool. surah encourages the Muslim community that, for example, try and consult each other. Okay. Yes, there's certain areas I won't let you consult. I pick my prophets on earth. You guys aren't consulting. <laughs> you don't choose who the prophets are. But there's other areas you consult. So, al istishara qabl al istikhara. Yep. Okay. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. We have another caller Hi. online. Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum as salam. Yes. Salam. Um, well, in school and in places of work, we, the Sunnis asked this question that uh, when it came to the prophets and asked Hajj, why didn't he announce Imam Ali in the Hajj and why did he have to go to Ghadir to announce the, okay. the Imam Ali's leadership? Thank you very much. Sure, it's a very good question. Um, first and foremost, Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib being spoken of mm -hmm. as the Khalifa of the Prophet was already uh, something that was spoken of years before Hajj. Yes, yes, yes. Um, and one example is Da'wat al-Ashira. Mm. In Da'wat al-Ashira, we have a clear the example. The dinner, as it were, yeah. Yeah, Muslims Invitation. from the beginning knew that if you put food in a program, people will turn of up. Of course, that's right. If there's food, everyone will turn up. So the Quran said, وَأَنذِرْ عَشِيرَتَكَ الْأَقْرَبِينَ right. Warn your nearest of nearest. kin. And you know the story. Yeah. He invites everybody. Whoever accepts me as the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon his family, says, will be my wasi, wasi and my khalifa after me. And everybody knows Ali, son of Abu Talib, was the only one. From that young age, the Prophet said, this is the khalifa and the wasi after me. Likewise, other occasions where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him positions higher than anyone around him. And who said it has to be in Hajj? Yeah. What is there? A law that we have to make announcements at Hajj, otherwise everybody's going to be misguided, then why does the Prophet stop at Khum? Mm -hmm. I ask this question. Sahih Muslim, go and look it up. I ask all the viewers. Okay. Go and look up. Type the word Khum, K-H-U-M-M in English. And when you do type it up, you will see the farewell pilgrimage. No. At Khum he stopped. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decides when he wants which message to be delivered on which occasion. Right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best why after Hajj make the Prophet stop at Khum. And someone could easily turn around and say, that's okay, he stopped at Khum, maybe for a rest. Why the need for more pronouncements and more guidance? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I leave behind for you two weighty two things. things. Yes. The book of Allah and my Ahl al -Bayt. Of course, some will always come and say, La, he's saying to us, 
I leave behind for the Quran, but try and maintain a relationship or look after my Ahlul Bayt. Buddy, he said, I leave two weighty two things. Weighty things. I don't care if it's maintain, look after, it's two weighty things. They are thaqalain. He stopped at khum. No Muslim alive can deny the tawatur of what happened at Ghadir. Authenticity. Nobody can deny it. brings us a certainty that on that day, man kuntu mawla, fa'adha aliyu mawla, Allahumma wali man wala wa adi man ada. No one can deny that there was an announcement regarding Ali, son of Abu Talib, not before Hajj, just in case there was a problem before Hajj, after Hajj at Khum. Right, right. Imam alayhi salam, there was an announcement concerning him. Now, naturally, if you tell someone, man kuntu mawla, father ali mawla, the word mawla, naturally they could turn around and say, listen, is there a qareena? Is there a context to this? Okay. And we know, al qara'in, usul, those who studied usul al fiqh will know, you have a qareena muttasala and a qareena munfasala. Okay. You can have a qareena in the same hadith, like a context right. that gives you the meaning of that word. Because, say, for example, if you have a word which has many meanings, I need to see, has the context been placed so okay, I know how it's right. used? So for example, if I say, there's a lion coming towards us, mm -hmm. you'd assume that's the animal, the of lion. Of course, yes. If I say, and he was a lion on the football pitch, the context yeah. is that he was a warrior, warrior. on that pitch, yeah. correct? Yeah. He's brave. Like someone like Steven Gerrard, for example. Yeah. He was phenomenal, like a lion on the football pitch. Um, <clears throat> or Fernando Torres in his prime, or Luis Suarez, or you know, or Jamie Carragher. These are lions. You obviously will not tell which team I support. Now, <laughs> likewise with what happened at Ghadir, there's a Qarina. And that Qarina, before men kuntu mawla, fada ali mawla, was that the Prophet made sure he showed us the word mawla, mm -hmm. in which Qarina? Surah 33 verse 6. And Nabi Aula Bil Mu'minina min Anfusihim. Aula. The Prophet has a greater right on authority than the believers has yes. or over you yes. or the believers have over themselves. The word Mawla, therefore, is in the Qareena of what? Aula. Correct? Okay, yes. And Nabi Aula bil Mu'minina. Alas to Aula bikum min anfusikum. Don't I have a greater right of authority than you do over yourself? They said yes. Men kuntu mawla. Yes. Men kuntu mawla. What is happening here? For men kuntu mawla, it is showing us that the word mawla is in relation to authority. So therefore, that person who comes and tells me, was Ali ibn Abi Talib spoken of as Khalifa before Ghadir? Yes. Was Ali ibn Abi Talib chosen on the day of Ghadir? No Muslim on earth can deny that an announcement was made. Yes, they may differ on the word mawla. Yeah. But I look yeah. at the qarina. And whether you want to look at a qarina from the angle of mutasala or munfasala, you'll still find that chapter 33, verse number 6 acts as a guide for us. Okay, alhamdulillah. Thank you for that deep um, insight. We've got one question that's come through, an anonymous question. As a woman, when doing tawaf in Umrah or Hajj, there is a fear of being molested. Um, so it, you may not be able to focus on a tawaf. Because it is very common, apparently. Um, what is Sayyidina's opinion? Well, uh, even as a man, there's a fear of being molested. For, you know, right. um, we've been on, on tawaf, and you sometimes wonder about that, about the behavior of some people. But naturally, we want to look after our sisters. Yeah, sure. We want to protect them. But, you know, don't just think about this. You're next to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and inshallah, it never happens to you. Okay. And if it does happen, then you'll find that. Even in the time of the Ahlul Bayt, mm -hmm. there were people who were sick in their heads like that. And all we can do is ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to try and protect us as much as possible. Yes. You know, if a person's going to do that next to the Kaaba, then this is the lowest of individuals. Right. Try not to think about this too much and hopefully it doesn't affect you. Okay, um, let's revert back to um, the main area of tonight's program, Hajj. Um, in particular, there's various stages or maqamat, as it were, of 
perhaps traveling, visitation, or actions that one has to perform whilst on Hajj. So for example, um, the stoning of the Trinity of um, the idols in Mina, Arafah, um, what is the significance of these? Well, Hajj is Arafah. Yeah. Let me be very blunt about to, this. I was just these are the, the words and the guidance of the Ahlul Bayt Islam. Hajj is Arafah. Why so? It's the most wonderful moment, I think, in, in the world of worship and Islam. What I find so amazing yeah. is the connection of Arafah to Imam Hussein. And Before Arafah, you even get there, right. what's amazing is that all I have to do is I've got to stay for a few hours on the plains of Arafah from Dhuhr until Maghrib. Okay. Not do anything, no dua, no salah, nothing, in the sense of, mm -hmm. that, you know, nothing which is not obligatory. And God forgives every single sin I've committed. Just for sitting there. SubhanAllah. And they tell me that my Lord wants to send people to hell. <laughs> <laughs> a Lord who I have disobeyed so much. A Lord who I feel I've let down so much. And then he tells me, come see me at Arafah, between Dhuhr and Maghrib. And if you doubt that I've forgiven you, then your Hajj is incomplete. If you doubt, because there are some people when they get there, they're like, you know what a sin I did when I was 16? Yeah, yeah. You know what a sin I performed when I was 21? You know what a bad act I did when I was... Allah is saying to you, don't worry. I don't care how big it was. You've come to see me, I am Rahman, Man, Rahim, Rahim Afar. Ghafoor, Kareem, mm. Wadud, Jawad, Ghani. Yeah. I'm your Mawla. Subhanallah. And, and that's what's so beautiful about Arafah. Really, you'll sit there, and like you mentioned quite wonderfully, we, the followers of Ahlul Bayt, we, Shi'at Al Muhammad, nobody comes near us in dua. No. Nobody comes no to us. You know, if you ever want to know how to be confident as a Shi'i, theology, other schools share, our, share theological texts. Fiqh, other schools have their own legal ordinances. Ethics, other schools have ethical treaties. No one's got our supplications. No one can write a dua like dua Arafah of Imam al Hussein. And you know what the sadness is? Many of our people don't probably don't read it. In the sense, apart from that one day at Hajj, if you ask them, have you ever since that day? Don't have to only, only have to read it. Hajj, read it when you're sitting Anytime. at home. Yeah. Instead of sometimes wasting your time watching rubbish. Or you know, there are some who just, they can sit for hours on these. What do they call these games, cameraman? Habibi, what do they call these games, the ones that people play on the mobile phone all day? Nintendo, Sega. What are they, what's it called? Yeah. Candy Crush? Yeah. And what's the other famous one? Fort? Fortnite. Fortnite. There are people who will stay playing these games non-stop and won't reflect on the heritage of Ahlul Bayt Alayhi Wasallam just even for 10-15 minutes. How sad. Wallah, Dua Araf of Imam Hussain is beautiful. Dua Araf of Imam Zain al Abidin is wonderful. And many people read Dua Araf of Imam Hussain. I ask them always try and read Dua Araf of Imam Zain al Abidin as well. Okay. These Imams, when they'd be at Arafah, they're sobbing. Because they could not believe just how merciful this Lord is. Yeah. That you may have sinned and transgressed against Him all these years. And that, that's what we need to inculcate in our mosques as well. Mm. You know, I'm not denying that you need Majalis talking about hell and, and so on. But yeah. buddy, don't make that every single lecture. Try and talk about God's mercy. God yes, loves yeah. us. God opens the doors of forgiveness. God wants all of us to know that there is guidance available for all. Yeah, sure, sure. We've got a quest, uh, caller coming in on the line and also two questions also via WhatsApp. Sure. Uh, and just a few minutes left now. So, um, salam alaikum. Alaikum salam. Alaikum salam. Yes, your question please. Um, why is it that visiting Karbala um, to Imam Hussein, why is that 70 or more times better than the reward of doing Hajj? Interesting question, but my dear sister, but that doesn't relate to the wajib Hajj. Mm. That relates to the mustahab Hajj. 
the wajib hajj, nothing can compare to it. Right. In the sense that it's obligatory on you. When then you've done that wajib hajj, you've done your obligatory. After that, there is nothing like the ziyar of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. Okay. You know, the Imams would blatantly say to people who've gone on 19 hajj, then they'll say, do one more. It will equal one ziyar of Imam al Hussein. Mm -hmm. So, wajib hajj, no. You can't be saying, I'm going ziyar all the time. I don't need to do hajj because I heard that hajj. Is the, the ziyarah is greater? No. The ziyarah is maybe greater than the hajj, which is mustahab. But the first wajib of hajj, nothing comes near it. Okay, yeah. okay. And uh, please advise if one has performed one hajj, can he go on another hajj? Or is it incumbent on him to pay for someone who is not being able to afford to go? That's a good question. Yeah, well, you know what? You can go on another Optional. hajj. You know, I, I can appreciate that there are people out there, for example, who feel that that first Hajj they went on, yeah, special. they either need a recharge of the battery or they feel they didn't understand it the way they understand it or their religiosity has increased since last time. Okay. Um, so I can understand if someone wants to go on a second Hajj. It doesn't have to be a case of, well, you I've been on one, that means I'm going to send someone else. Uh -huh. Well, mashallah, if you do send someone else to your credit, that's amazing. Yes. Um, but I can understand if someone wants to do a second Hajj to continue uh, improving and working on themselves. Okay, uh, I mean, alhamdulillah. I've but let's not, just, just sorry Muhammad, yeah. to interrupt you. Let's also make clear that don't make Hajj this get out for you that I'll do sins next year yeah, as well. Because yeah. I know I'm going Hajj anyway. It'll it's like the clean. ones who, who donate to charity. There are two types. There's the one who gives to charity because he sincerely wants to help the creations of Allah. There's another who gives to charity because done so much haram that year, he's like, you know, I need to donate to a mosque urgently. Otherwise, everything that I've done is going to catch up with me. Likewise with Hajj, don't make it a case of, you know what, I need to go to Hajj because I've done so much haram. Then come back from Hajj. I'll do the haram again because I know I'm going to go to Hajj at the end of the year. Don't have that mentality. Right, yeah. right. I mean, alhamdulillah, I've been invited to go on Hajj. Mm. What advice would you give myself and also potential hujjaj who are been invited to Hajj, what would you say? In terms of, obviously, in, in addition to enjoying it and being real and sincere, and what would you say to first-timers? I'd say that, you know, try build your relationship with Allah SWT with the Ahlul Bayt. Okay. Imam Sadiq says, uh, you've been told to come and visit these stones and rocks, and then after that to submit to us, Al Muhammad. Okay. So try and uh, build your relationship with them. Make a Hajj resolution. Right. This is what I'm going to do when I return. Maybe I've realized my Quran recital is not as good as it could be, or mm -hmm. my understanding of Quran is lacking. Okay. You know, okay. maybe build on these areas. And especially when you go, try and remember the Imam of your time, how much of a relationship you have with him and how much you can improve. Okay, just one final question now, but we've got hardly two minutes left. Um, very, very briefly, how do you think or does the sacrifice of the animal whilst on Hajj, that, inshallah, we've been told that washes away our sins, it's a reliever. It, how does that co correlate to the great waqa of Karbala? But if you can, possibly, is there, is there is yeah, there a connection? Is there a I correlation? Think, I think, you know, I think the poet says it beautifully. Right. When he's standing in Karbala on the day of Arafah, and he looks towards the people who are at Hajj. Oh, you who are about to drink Zamzam, my tears for Hussein make the real Zamzam. And oh, you who are about to... O oh, you who are about to sacrifice a sheep, come to me in the land of sacrifice. And truly, you know, Abraham's sacrifice was his son, Allah replaced it. Whereas with Imam al-Hussein alayhi salam, he had to witness those sons die one by one. Yeah. yeah. Okay, Sayyidina, so from Dr. Sayyid Amar Naqshwani. Um, Salaamu alaykum and from myself, Muhammad Ali also. And inshallah, viewers who have been invited to Hajj, um, I wish you Mubarak as well. And inshallah, join us again next time. Yeah, yeah, yeah.